So I'll start. I'm John Collins. I'm uh, studying for my PhD at the London School of Economics, and I do the diplomatic history of international drug control. So I'm not actually an economist, but I do I have some background in economics, so I should be able to talk something coherent about it. So yeah, we've now economists here, which is nice, because I kind of, Lev told me to keep this kind of Econ 101. Does anyone have any background in economics at all? Good. Okay. Right. Okay, well, right. you can right. call, Sorry. you can have a line with me, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> and you can both call BS then if I say something wrong. Um, okay, so I'm going to divide this into two. I'll do a quick overview of some market theory and just how we kind of can look at the prohibition markets, and then I'll go into some political economy as the second section. Um, so I think, as, to start with a basic premise, or premise or, and just the basics of what we're going to be looking at, um, you probably know this whole political argument about whether economics is useful, whether, whether people are actually rational or whether they're wholly irrational. Have people heard this debate recently? Well, I think a, a simpler uh, kind of basic premise to have is that people respond to incentives. Um, I think everything else in the economics follows from that. So, you know, if there's five pounds lying on the floor, eventually somebody will pick it up in the context of the fact that they'll be embarrassed or that there's social norms and all these kind of things. So all other things in economics flow from this. We've got the law of demand, which basically says that as prices increase, uh, the quantity of a good demanded goes down. It's just the most basic principle of economics. And then you've also got the law of supply, which says that as prices increase, the quantity of supply will increase, just because there's more money available and the supplier is going to want some of that money, so they produce more. And it's the intersection between supply and demand which produce what we call a market equilibrium. So what's actually going on in the market at the moment? So, you know, the interaction between what people are demanding in Apple products versus what Apple is actually able to sell at the market price is the current equilibrium that we have. Does, do I have everybody still? Okay. Uh, and so this is kind of like the underlying proviso of economics, setters, paribus, all things being equal. And this is kind of, yeah, you have to include this with every model you produce. It's just kind of like, you know, it, 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 it's our simplification. Um, and I think prohibition, the main, where this really comes in, is it, it really undermines this notion of settlers' powers. It throws everything kind of into disarray. Um, normal market forces aren't allowed to actually interact as they normally would. And it, it kind of creates all this perverse incentive structure. So to come back to this notion of incentives, it kind of just throws everything out, really. Um, and this is where we get what this lecture is called, the economics of prohibition. Right, so a simple supply curve is, I presume, our A-level and past economic student, you've seen this. So, some very simply, um, price is on this axis here, and quantity is on this axis here. And all it's basically saying is that uh, the quantity supplied responds to the price. So, as price increases from 20p to 50p, let's say this is a market for pencils, the quantity supplied will increase in a reasonably proportional amount. Um, so, yeah, it's just a very... Presum presumably this linear section is only, is fairly finite, though, like... You don't, you don't imagine that if the price you keeps pushing up, the supply just keeps going... There. No, no, there's all sorts of constraints, but this is just at our most utterly basic, simplified way of thinking about it. Um, and then the law of demand is just kind of that in reverse. As the price goes up, you see a reasonably proportional fall in, uh, in the quantity demand. So, you know, again, if you think of pencils, you might be willing to pay 20p for a pencil, but you're not willing to pay 50p, so your, your quantity falls in line with that. Now, yeah, as I said, this is a very simplified version, and then you get into a thing called elasticities, um, which is basically how quantities respond to changes in price. So, if you think of something, we have elastic on one level, and then you have inelastic on the other. And if you think of fast food as an elastic product, it's basically, you will pay up to a pound or a pound fifty for a McDonald's hamburger, you won't pay over that. So if McDonald's increases the price of hamburgers to two pounds, it just completely collapses, they lose all their demand. So it's not a proportional change, it's an absolute change. This helps us a lot in how we think of drugs, because a lot of drugs are addictive. Um, so, you know, if you're a heroin user, you really, really need heroin and you're not going to be as responsive to price changes. So what you see is actually, what the government is in effect doing with the prohibition is increasing the price artificially. They're raising it from price two to price one. Well, if you're a heroin user, you're not actually going to respond in kind. You're probably more likely to cut out how much food you consume or how much you spend on shelter, other things before you cut, cut out heroin. So there's a less than proportional fall in the quantity consumed of heroin. 
So the price increases a lot, but the quantity goes down a little. This is something governments are very aware of. This is why they love taxing cigarettes and booze, because these are inelastic goods that people always can, will always want. So you can put up the price of cigarettes by 50p, and you'll only see a small decline. So then, if we think of the, the supply aspect, um, this is the revenue lost to, like, say if you're a drug supplier, that's the revenue you've lost by this artificially high price, because there's a slightly smaller demand. That's the revenue you've gained, because revenue is price times, or, yes, price times quantity. So if you subtract that from that, you can see that that's much larger. And this is what, it's not quite, but we can think of it as what we call super normal profits. It's this excess profits that accrue to illicit markets. And this kind of explains why drugs are so profitable and so, so hard to get rid of. Okay, now just to get into then kind of a broader conceptual way of looking at illicit drugs market. Well, it is a global commodity market, and it, these are integrated markets around the world taking all sorts of different production procedures and supply procedures. It's, it's phenomenally complicated. And it crosses national boundaries as well. So this, I presume everyone here has heard of the balloon effect? That you push down a balloon in one area, but it rises up in another. And that's, it's just because it is an international commodity market. If you think of wheat, if there's a drought in Australia, one year the price of wheat goes up. Uh, wheat farmers in England all of a sudden respond to this and plant wheat instead of corn, and the, it eventually levels out. So you can't actually push it down because it's an international market. You can only shift it around. I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay. And so supply will always meet, meet demand in the international drug market. It's just it's it's almost a law. It just will happen. You can't stop that. Um, but the equilibriums are affected by prohibitions incentive structures. So there's, you'll always come across this theme in the economics of prohibition that you can't eradicate it, but you can shift it. And that's in, in all sorts of areas of it. You can't er eradicate the supply, but you can shift it. You can't eradicate the demand, but you can shift it into other drugs, all these kind of little micro changes. And I think this is why um, this kind of theoretical approach is actually the most powerful way I think we have of understanding uh, what's actually going on in prohibition at the moment. I don't think, you can't empirically look at seizures or supply figures or anything like that and say this is what's going on in the market because it's just, it's operating in the shadows. Drug dealers do not keep records of what they're supplying, all these kind of things. So I think the theoretical approach is actually the most powerful one we have. Right, now if we think of uh, prohibition as regulation, this, is, this kind of leads us into some interesting um, ideas. Yeah, so all free markets re need regulation. That's like, even the most hardened Thatcherite is not going to argue against that. The, absent, the total absence of regulation is what we call a state of nature. Anyone familiar with Thomas Hobbes, John Locke? That, the, it, 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 I suggest you look it up. It's some very interesting kind of enlightenment philosophers talking about what humanity is like outside civilization. Um, and it's how life is short and brutish and nasty and all these kind of things because there is no kind of governing structure. And that's what markets are like outside regulation. There's no means to enforce contracts. There's no means to make sure that people are going to do what they say they're going to do. Um, and so the goal of prohibition is to have total regulation of the market. You're trying to stop supply meeting demand. But the actual outcome of prohibition is that basically um, you create this kind of state of nature of utter absence of regulation. There is no regulation of the global prohibition market. Government intervenes and pushes it around a little bit, but really they have no clue what's actually going on. Um, and so what you see in, emerge as kind of the means of enforcing contracts is violence. Um, Jeffrey Myron, he's a Harvard economist, he's a famous uh, libertarian economist, he's written a lot about this. And he says basically, you know, if, if you're Benson and Hedges and you supply cigarettes to a local gas station, you know they will pay you back or else you can bring them to court. You have no such, uh, such enforcement mechanism in a prohibited market. So you use either violence or the threat of violence or some other coercive means. And that's why you see violence in prohibited markets. Right, here's another point. I will love this as well. Uh, government intervention always has unintended consequences. Always. It's, an, it's a law of economics. This is not to say that governments shouldn't intervene in markets, but it, all, it, it always happens. And it's the, the good governments are the ones that can account for this and recognize this fact. You know, it, it might sound great to raise income tax rates to 80%. 
But the unintended consequence of that could be that people shift money overseas, that they, they start tax evading, all these kind of things, and tax revenues could actually go down below what they were at the, pre the lower level. So this is just one of those unintended consequences. Um, so the goal of prohibition uh, is obviously to prohibit drugs, but because this is impossible to prevent, all they can really do is disrupt price mechanisms um, and, and other factors, but particularly the price mechanism. Um, and this is really important. I don't know, are people here familiar with Friedrich von Hayek? Yeah, so the Hayek-Keynes debate. Um, the, there is this kind of libertarian school, which, you know, they're, they're, they're very free market, but they, um, one of the, the central points that this, this post-war debate, it was between John Maynard Keynes and Friedrich Hayek after the war, and there was this kind of sense that governments were going to take a greater role in planning the economy. It was successful during World War II, we can do it in the post-war era. And all these Austrian school economists are saying no, because prices are so vital to the, the functioning of the economy that there's more information contained within a price than any bureau, government bureaucrat will ever have. You know, the 40p price tag for a pencil, you know, that, that's, that's describing what's going on in markets across the world, like why Bolivian mine, miners are going into lead mines and why that lead is being shipped up to the West and all these kind of things. So you, these, you can't overestimate how, how important the, this price mechanism is, mechanism is, and prohibition just completely destroys that. Um, and it kind of creates this, I'm coming to the end now, it kind of creates this kind of internal dynamic where prohibition defeats itself. You know, if you take D equals K, it just means demand is constant. So if we take demand as constant, and you interdict drugs coming into the UK, so say there's 10% less heroin in the market tomorrow than there was yesterday, all that does is drive up price, and as we know from the law of supply, when price goes up, supply goes up. So it's the, the direct outcome of interdiction is to increase supply. That's a completely incoherent uh, dynamic. So it's 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 just it's not a sustainable policy approach. There's nothing rational about this. Any simple economics will tell us this. Oh, at the end of part one, I should have said part two is the political economy, um, and this is basically just looking how markets and politics interact. Um, first point is that prohibition is essentially corrupting. I don't think I need to really make that point. Like Al Capone in the 1930s is, is the perfect example. Um, there was a good book written about Asia. I know, I presume everyone here has heard of the single convention. And we talk a lot about that as that's when prohibition began and securitized and all this. Uh, no, but um, the, this book looks at Asia. And the drug, drugs as a commodity market in Asia from 1900 to about 1950. And it's looking at what happens as they gradually become illegal, as they gradually get pushed into the illicit market. And what they find is that there's this kind of symbiosis between legitimate po political power brokers and uh, illicit markets. And they, these two kind of grow up together. And these are eight parts of Asia which don't really have traditions of strong central government, so the two become completely reliant on each other. You know, you have uh, illicit suppliers, they need protection from police. So they bribe politicians. And as the risk of a certain market action, you know, shifting heroin through a certain part of Burma becomes more risky, they'll increase the price they're willing to pay politicians. And then eventually, you know, there's no politician that can withstand certain levels of bribery. Um, so there, there is this kind of interaction between the two. And it, 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 it kind of, it shapes a lot. Like there's no drug market in the world that doesn't witness this kind of corruption. It's just dependent on how strong the state structures are, etc. Um, another way to think about it is this kind of notion of a double funnel. Um, if we think of the United States as a massive demand market and Latin America as a massive supply market for cocaine, the two meet here, let's say around the Mexican border. The people at this end of the market don't get very well remunerated. <coughs> it's just a large part of the market that returns them, goes them. So you've got crack dealers in Baltimore here who uh, don't get paid very well. You've got coca farmers here from Bolivia or Peru or Colombia or wherever. It's the people here who can get it past this narrow point. And there's very few people in the world who can actually do this. It's a few very highly, ca as she describes, very highly capitalized individuals. And don't just think of it as monetary capital, it's political capital, it's social capital. And all the returns go to these people. So that, you know, most of the money in prohibition actually goes to a few, uh, a, a very few. Uh, a small number of people, and as you get closer to it, the returns increase, and they decrease as you get further from it. So this is just another example of prohibition shifting returns. Um, but it's actually, you could almost think of it as a way the government is effectively subsidizing the people at the middle, um, and I'll come back to that point in a minute. Um, 
One of the last points then is it, this notion of seizures as a seizures as a metric of success. I talked about uh, why I think economic theory is a good way of uh, understanding what's going on because seizures tell us utterly nothing about what's going on in the market. Um, some of the best, some of the top estimates you'll hear is government maybe seizes eight percent of what comes through. Some of the lower end estimates is one percent. You know, corporation tax in the UK is twenty four percent. You know. <laughs> It's a fraction of what tax is even in, in, in the UK. Um, and it's, it's indicative of political circumstances more than market conditions. So what we see playing out in the newspapers of you know, 200 kilos of heroin seized out in the UK or you know, Mexico, a certain cartel member was arrested, is really what's actually going on at the local level. There's an interaction between you know, whether this guy was paying the right police officers or whether one of his competitors wanted to push him out of the market so they provided information to the police and the police sees that they get credit for it but they know they haven't really dented the market. So there's just no reason to go on this kind of thing. Yet, the international system is all about seizures. This is, this is what all the focus is on. Um, yeah, and so to reiterate just the point I was saying there, Milton Friedman, who I'm sure most of you probably don't agree with, but he made the point that under prohibition, the role of government is to protect cartels. Um, and then I'll just, because I wanted to throw an Adam Smith quote in, it's not quite uh, totally relevant, but I think if you reword it a little bit, it, it does make sense. And this is, you know, two and a half centuries ago, so he kind of predicted this stuff. Um, yeah, I think that's about it.